to find the image for the front of this bulletin, I just searched Texas ancestors, and I found some. I don't know these people, <laughs> but I know something about the family just by looking, just by knowing about families. You can look at the old guy with the white beard in the front row, sitting next to the less old guy with a white beard in the front row. <laughs> and you, you can tell that he's distressed by the younger generation. <laughs> They're not making decisions the way he would and he thinks they might be going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Look at these women's faces. Some of them keep their thoughts to themselves and some of them don't. <laughs> Couple of them have married fellas that weren't quite right for them according to their daddies and mamas. Everybody's worried about those three children in the front. <laughs> Four children. They just don't know what's going to become of them, the world the way it is. This morning, because it's All Souls Day, yesterday was All Saints, the day before was All Hallows Eve. This is a time of year when our thoughts turn to our ancestors. And what I want to talk to you about today is some of our personal ancestors and some of our faith's ancestors. And the main point of what I want to say is that we get a lot of good things from our ancestors. And then we get a lot of other things that aren't helpful to us. And we can keep those unhelpful things with us in one way or another. One, by doing exactly the opposite, which keeps them with us. Or by doing exactly what we're expected to do, which keeps them with us. Either way is not good for growth. What's good for growth is to take what your family gave you, move forward with your own life. So I could sit down right there, but I got some other stories to tell you. I knew in my family that being smart was the most important thing. If you weren't brilliant, you might as well just give up. Uh, I know this because I heard my dad and his sister Ruth arguing. She would always say, Donald, oh hush, you know I'm right, I'm smarter than you are. And he would say, Ruth, you're not that much smarter. And she would say, I was 213 on the IQ test and you were only 212. <laughs> Makes a difference. Writing books was important. You had to write books in order to be somebody in my family. Um, my dad told me I should write children's books. I don't know why. Maybe because I'd started one when I was 10. Um, maybe because that's what he wanted to do. Uh, and children are called to live out the unlived life of their parents. But I did not write children's books. I wrote six of these books of creative nonfiction stories from my life. And he still says, Oh, I know, you have six books, but you should write a children's book. <laughs> what that tells me is nothing is going to be enough. <laughs> it's okay. I did write a children's book just to do it, and now he just says, well, you just write popular stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You can trust people to be themselves. You can trust your whole family to be themselves, and that is something upon which you can rely. And so when you have ancestors with many fine qualities and one or two stinky ones, you can just look forward to the next time the stinky ones show up so you're not surprised while you're enjoying all the good ones. I wanted to read you a story uh, about my mother. She grew up in India, and uh, her parents were missionaries. So I'm going to tell you two stories about them. One is about fireworks, but that's not this one. 
This is called Joy in Ordinary Time. My mama was a second grade teacher at the Gladwin Elementary School in the rich suburbs of Philadelphia. She loved the children, but she was shy with the parents, who were financiers, pro ball players and attorneys, members of the junior league, cricket clubs, and fox hunting clubs. For Christmas, she would get amazing presents. One year, she got a bottle of Joy perfume, then $150 an ounce. I don't know that she ever wore it. She was keeping it for a special occasion. She kept it so long that it finally evaporated. With other things, she was more open-handed. We had grandfather's china and silver, which she often used. That's what they're meant for, she'd say, to be used. There's no point in saving them. If we did, you'd never see them. That open-handedness did not extend to her own person. She wore sensible clothes, comfortable shoes, and white cotton underwear. She had grown up the child of missionaries, and whether she wanted it or not, the missionary stream ran deep in her. She looked respectable and kind. She was cute and cheerful and funny. Joy perfume did not seem to me to fit who she was. A daughter never does see all the sides of her mother. It makes me smile now to think that Mama harbored a hope that there would come an occasion where she might walk into a room smelling rich and sophisticated, cherished and valued, in which it would be just the thing for her to wear. She let my sister and me smell it whenever we wanted to. The bottle sat like an honored but intimidating guest on her dresser. Whenever we smelled it, we marveled at how much it had cost. I don't remember it ever occurring to me to wear it. I want to let this lesson sink deep into me. Celebrate the body the trooper of a body that carries you through life, that pleasures you and lets you dance. Celebrate your body now before you have lost the weight, before you get your muscle definition, before you feel justified by the harsh eyes of your own expectations. Good morning to you. <laughs> Celebrate being alive, drawing breath. Celebrate that you are achingly sad today and that it will pass. It is good to be able to feel feelings. Celebrate that there was a love so big and good that it hurt to lose it, that there was a time so sweet that you ache remembering it. Honor the flowering of the tomato plants, the opening of the daylilies, the lemon smell of magnolias. Honor the ache of your heart and the tears falling. Life is mostly ordinary time. Ordinary time shot through with light and pain and love. Lavish joy on ordinary time. Hope is a wonderful thing. It is good to imagine a time when things will be better, but not if it makes you put off splashing yourself with joy. So this is a lesson that I have gotten from doing differently from what my mother did. Ordinary time was not really honored in our families. We were always saving up for something, putting money aside for a rainy day. We sometimes celebrated on the spur of the moment, but it was because we had a, something to celebrate. Birthdays were big, Christmas was bigger. Ordinary time was to be hurried through until the next big deal or until Jesus came back. <laughs> it is hard even now to get through a conversation with that part of the family without hearing about Jesus coming back. When I was in eighth grade, I would say, oh, gosh, I'm so worried about studying for this math test. And my dad would say, cheer up, Maggie. Maybe Jesus will come back before your math test and you won't have to take it. <laughs> you might want to study was really never... And I never wanted to ask him for help with my math because he was a professional mathematician and he would go back to dirt when he was teaching you how to do something, which came in handy because during the SAT, I kind of had forgotten how to do long division because it had been so long, so I just had to go back through the theories and invent long division again and then I could do it. So I thank him for that. And you haven't lived till you've heard his children's sermon on the three kinds of infinity. <laughs> I 
This is part of it. <laughs> but I can't recreate it for you. I'll try to film it next time I see it. So um, ordinary time was not really uh, part of things. We had to we had to be achieving all the time or making something of ourselves all the time, which I don't think is a bad thing. That's a fine thing. Um, at dinner time, my dad was a news guy. He ended up in the CBS um, news commentary business in Philadelphia. And so we would have to stand during dinner and give, uh, he would say, Maggie, uh, stand up and tell us about the situation between the Hutu and the Tutsi. Oh. My sister just refused, but it never occurred to me, so I would study up on the Hutu and the Tutsi. <laughs> Don't ask me about it now, though. Here's a story about me and my dad called Sandcastles. The other day I remembered a blue plastic bucket that was part of a mold for a sandcastle. In my mind's eye, I could see the bright blue of it against the sand. At the Jersey Shore, summer of 65, my dad and I would build sandcastles together. Building the sandcastles was one of the only times my dad and I didn't talk. We were seldom quiet. There was almost always a back and forth flow between us. It wasn't exactly conversation. He would ask me what I thought of something and I would say a few things and then ask him what he thought. I suspected his questions were a way to give him space to think aloud with me as his audience. I was his best audience. To be fair, he was mine too. Whatever I said was brilliant to him. I felt interesting and smart, as long as I turned it back over to him pretty fast. <laughs> I don't know from here whether that was his need or mine. A green and a yellow mold had come with the blue one. The green was the straight part of a castle wall, and the yellow was a corner. We shoveled the wet sand into the blue bucket and patted it down with our hands. The sun roasted our pale Scotch-Irish skin. Turn it over just right, lift the mold straight up, and you had a perfect castle tower with crenellations along the top. I loved the crenellations. I wanted to walk along a life-size castle wall in a warm evening wind, looking out through the gaps, a scarf floating from the top of my cone-shaped hat, my dragonfly green dress shimmering in the dusky light. My quiver of arrows would be ready at hand, along with my bow in case of the sudden appearance of enemies. These days, the tide has washed thousands of times over what my father and I built together, over our conversations, over the morals and the religion and the politics. The clean and clear lines have washed away, but essential shapes remain. They affect my inner flow, not as much as they once did, but what my father gave me is still discernible. Does the fact that I've changed most of what he gave me mean that he failed? Not at all. The process of building with him, the pleasure, the companionship, the burn, is what shaped me. Building my own castles now with my children, I keep in mind that they are not forever. This feels like love. So you do your best with your children. Most of our parents did their best with us, whether they were our biological parents or our adoptive parents. We get what they gave us. Your children get what you gave them. And then they use it in their own ways. I sometimes feel OK with this with my children. As long as they continue to vote the way that I do. One of them at one time said he was going to become an accountant. And I couldn't imagine where that came from, because it's not from his father or me, or anybody else in our family. All the men are doctors or ministers, and all the women are teachers or doctors. I was the first minister. I wasn't supposed to be. The ancestor said, be a doctor or a minister. Those are the best things to be. It was a huge scandal when my Aunt Martha married an engineer. <laughs> People thought the family was about to unravel. Everyone in my generation, because we were raised with 
legalistic view of the law, everyone in my generation became a lawyer. Here's what we had to work with. Our ancestors gave us a Sunday that we had to call Sabbath. And on Sabbath, you couldn't do anything but nap or go to church, read the Bible, memorize Bible verses, or eat meals. So, I've told some of you that we would see kids in their um, station wagons all loaded up with floats and noodles and stuff, and they were going swimming, obviously, and we'd say, Mama, those kids get to go to the lake on Sabbath? And she would say, Honey, they're Catholics. <laughs> I really wanted to be a Catholic when I was young. <laughs> but we had rules, and we couldn't listen to any of our music on Sabbath, so we would wake ourselves up at midnight 01 and just listen to a song a 45, and then go back to sleep, just because we could. So it's really, oh, and we couldn't play, um, I've told some of y'all this too, we couldn't play battleships on Sabbath, you know, the game where you make a grid on your paper and you fill them out. So my mother would let us play, only we had to call it uh, donkeys instead of battleships, and the, uh, the donkeys were going up to Jerusalem where the thieves would try to um, throw stones at the donkeys. And so the game, instead of being battleships, was called Go Into Jerusalem. <laughs> it's no wonder they all became lawyers. When I decided to become a minister, I was told at a family reunion, which is, as you know, 81 people. Um, now, your grandfather had a desk that was to go to the next minister in the family, and I just don't know if that would be you or not. <laughs> but we handled it like white Southern people, which is that you just be polite and pretend it's not happening. It is the way of my tribe. <laughs> now, our Unitarian ancestors were Boston intellectuals. They did not believe that God could send any one of them to hell because they were too smart and had too much money. They were a tad cranky. Some of them began a new form of a religion, transcendentalism, a kind of paganish Eastern European Eastern uh, religion influence. Um, that was Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, all the transcendentalists who uh, clustered in Concord, Massachusetts. Ralph Waldo Emerson hated when you quoted people. He said he hated, I, to quote him, I hate quotations. <laughs> he said people should have their direct lived experience and talk about what they thought and from their own experience, which he did at length and got paid money to do. He quit the church, got mad and quit. This is another tradition in the Unitarian Church. You get mad and quit. Um, you know the joke about the guy who'd been on a deserted island for 10 years and he got picked up and as the boat was pulling away from the island, um, the sailors on the boat said, I'm so interested in those buildings on the, on the island. What are they? Um, what's that one? He said, oh, that's my house. I built it, um, told them how he built it. And he said, and what's that one? He said, that's my church. I, I worship there. And, and what's that third building? He goes, oh, that's the church I used to go to. Our Unitarian ancestors were brave experimenters, many of them. They, they liked to start utopian communities. They wanted to go back to the land. Bronson Alcott, Louisa May Alcott's daddy, had started a school in Boston that got closed down because he let the children decide their own course of study, leave their desks, and he taught them sex ed. So the school got closed down. And then he used to um, just come and sit in front of his family's 
house at a bit on a bench by the road um, and talk educational theory with people. And so people were known to cut through the backyards to try to avoid um, passing in front of Bronson Alcott. But he liked going back to the land. He liked the idea of going back to the land. And a bunch of Unitarians wanted to go with him, and they had this utopian community, Brooks Farm, for a while. But it turned out, actually, none of them really knew how to farm. <laughs> and they would rather talk about farming than actually farm. <laughs> Many of them were early adapters. As I said, they read the Eastern scriptures, which were just then being translated and introduced into the United States. They were brilliant philosophizers. They were early adapters of new diets as well. Many of them were vegetarians for their health and because they felt ethically that it was a better idea. Bronson Alcott's family was vegetarian. Louisa May Alcott grew up vegetarian. And so it, it is quite wonderful how we have these ancestors who were open-minded, thinking, ready to experiment people. Um, some of them were abolitionists and some of them were not. And we have a similar split in our churches um, now when it comes to social justice issues, as we should, because people have, I guess, lots of different ideas. Uh, although, to me, I wish they had all been abolitionists. But some of them just felt that it was making too many waves and they didn't want to um, take such a controversial stand. Uh, plus, all of Boston is built on slave money, uh, money from the work of enslaved men and women, which um, they're just now discovering. <laughs> and so what I want to say is we still have these strains in our DNA the Universalists were, were uh, open-hearted, blue-collar folks who felt not that they were too good for God to send them to hell, but that God was too good to send them to hell. They wanted to be spiritual, they wanted to worship God, and they wanted to worship a God who made sense, um, i.e. a God who loves you but won't send you straight to hell, who um, saves everybody, which is wonderful. And they are... Um, another strain in the DNA of our churches today. So what I want us to do is to take all of that experimentation and open-mindedness and um, open-heartedness and crankiness and use that to move forward and make the kind of church we want to make. Now, in my family, um, my Aunt Ruth, you've heard about her before, she took what was given to her by her family and moved beyond her family. They taught her um, to be or intelligent, um, willful, and um, adventuresome, to travel without a thought. Uh, they forgot, or it didn't take, uh, the obedience part. So... She um, went to Vassar at 14, graduated, got married, uh, didn't like family life, left. Um, I'm sure it's more complicated than that. Left uh, her dad. My grandfather was a famous radio evangelist, so it made national news when she was found selling flowers on the front steps of the cathedral in Taos. Um, they brought her back home and um, tried to keep her there. She went to New York and uh, applied to NYU for medical school. And um, so her dad went up to the NYU admissions board and said, this is a, a young woman who has run away from home and uh, you may not let her in. <laughs> At which point NYU let her in, toot sweet, and uh, so she could get away from her dad. My dad was supposed to be a minister. Um, he decided he wanted to be an opera singer instead. Um, took lessons but was told that he had too long a neck. I don't understand this story. But um, he became a nuclear physicist student, a student of nuclear physics, and uh, did all the dissertation there before he finally got sucked into seminary. And I, um, this happens to everyone in my family. 
His brother David was a urologist till he retired and went to seminary, became an Episcopal priest. Uh, my Aunt Ruth was a psychiatrist till she went to seminary and became an Episcopal priest. <laughs> um, the other daughter, Dorothy, was a, an opera singer and a detective in San Francisco. <laughs> She's in her 80s, still rides her bike. Her bike, San Francisco. And um, she didn't go to seminary, but she did become an Episcopal missionary in Managua. It's very hard to escape the pull of your ancestors. It's very hard to escape the expectations of your ancestors. It's very hard to let go of what they gave you. So my suggestion is not to let it go, but rather just to acknowledge it, to honor it in some way, and then move forward. Use it to move forward. They gave you stubbornness, good. Uh, my children had stubbornness. I wish I could have just turned it on when they turned 21, but no, they have it the whole time. And, uh, <laughs> but now they have children just like them. <laughs> so you acknowledge it because if you don't acknowledge it, it just sits there and it's part of you, but it's not a fruitful part of you because you're trying to push it down. It's like trying to sit on a beach ball in the ocean. You're not gonna be steady and when it pops up, it's gonna pop up even higher because you were sitting on it. Hear what I'm saying? This is what they call shadow work. You have qualities you don't really like. They came from your family. Maybe it's the temper. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's the desire to please everybody. Uh, maybe it's desire to be just the sweetest person in the whole wide world. And um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but if you can't wipe the smile off your face, there's something wrong. <laughs> I'm in karate class in my 30s with uh, everybody else in the class was 11. And, um, <laughs> and the teacher's having us make our face, you know, <clears throat> like that. And there are these girls, these little South Carolina girls, and they're just like, <sighs> <laughs> and she goes, wipe that smile off your face. <laughs> they can't do it. She's like, next person that smiles drops and gives me 20 push-ups. She trained them to smile voluntarily. This is important. They already moved past some of the things that they were taught. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're all about. I invite you to think about your ancestors and take an inventory of what they left you that was good and what they gave you that was not helpful. And then just look at those unhelpful qualities and say, they are there and I'm going to move on. I'll be interested in hearing how it goes.